Hey, so I wanted to do a, a video about astrophysics because I wanted to, and that's all I need. And yeah, so this is the debate going on in my head, and it is the age old debate between the origin of the universe and um, religion. So, scientifically speaking, uh, the origins of the universe versus theologically speaking, the origins of the universe. And I don't believe that this is settled science. In fact, I don't believe science should ever be settled. And I think that anybody who's not a religious zealot or pursuing their own selfish endeavors, um, including those of, of just the ego, uh, would admit that, at least in a professional environment. So, what is the beginning? And in my mind, it comes back to basic physics. You know, look at it like a reductionist. Um, if every event has a, a preceding causal event, then there always has to be a preceding event, meaning there is no beginning. Now, the opposite side to that argument is there has to be some beginning because, in other words, you have a perpetual motion machine. And a perpetual motion machine is impossible because you're always going to lose energy to the system. And this is one of the first laws, or one of the first laws, that makes sense. This is the second law of thermal dynamics, is that um, there is always resulting energy loss to the system, essentially. And that is referred to as enthalpy, I believe, um, or entropy. I always get the two confused. Uh, but anyway, it, it basically is chaos into the system as a result of uh, work being done. So work being done means energy lost. Energy lost means required energy input has to be higher than the resulting work that is being done. And because of that, um, we can't have perpetual motion machines because you always have to put more energy into the system than the system is going to give you out. And if the system is always going to give you out less energy than you're putting in, you're eventually going to run out of energy. And that's, that's it. So that is basically evident in the world around us as far as we can perceive. And both of those ideas, when you look at them in a reductionist sort of way, uh, originate with um, conflicting consequences, let's say. Because if you always have to put more energy in than you're getting out, then the universe has to have a beginning. And if... Um, I'm sorry. Uh, and, and basically, if uh, every action has a preceding causal reaction, an object at rest will stay at rest until an outside force acts on it, then there has to be an outside force. Otherwise, nothing would be moving. So the idea that things would just start moving requires an outside force. So this is basically the idea of theology intersecting with reductionist scientific thought, in my opinion. And they basically both can't be simultaneously true in the same dimension. So how can you go about proving which theory is incomplete and many scientists have done so. And to date, the predominant theory has been 
you know, the Big Bang, creationism, and that has been reinforced, in my opinion, through selectively funded scientific research and selective education within a cultural paradigm that isn't necessarily scientifically open-minded. Um, I consider myself outside of that cultural paradigm, at least in my current mind state, and I look at it with a discerning eye. So this is my perspective on the matter. Um, if you had concrete proof of a Big Bang, it would be evident when we looked at the stars. And what I mean by that is you would be able to, with some degree of certainty, locate the direction of the source of the Big Bang. And the mechanism to do so would be angular momentum as a consequence of that explosive force. Bam! In all directions. So even if we're out in this vector point in that, you know, 4D matrix, we could look in a direction and see the expanding space and matter um, and in other areas of the sky uh, see it kind of more compressed as a, uh, again, an angular force from, from a, a center point. Um, it should be measurable in the distance between the stars as you get further and further away from the source. And as you look closer and closer towards the source, the concentration of, of matter should be less, less spaced um, and more concentrated, I should say. So the, the reason, one of the big reasons I don't believe in the Big Bang is because when we look out in the stars, for the most part, we see fairly even concentration of space. And in fact, we are seeing pulls and pushes in multiple different directions. And it's, it's simply not a clear cut case of angular momentum from a single space. We can see that direction based on, on the, on the spacing. It's not there. So the fact that there is no evidence of angular momentum in the star distribution, in the galaxy distribution, tells me that there was not one explosion that gave rise to the entire universe. Um, the evidence for the contrary was developed by as I understand it, Stephen Hawking, who um, proposed that a steady state universe is impossible because of entropy and that is um, evident even in black holes, where you could say that the energy was being lost, that... Um, Elements were being deconstructed in, from complex forms back into simple forms and ultimately maybe even back into energy and simplified instead of being more complex, reordered instead of being in a chaotic state. And in fact, at the same time, as things are being restructured into order from chaos inside a black hole, energy is being lost. And if that is the case, then black holes will be emitting radiation and we just can't perceive it with our eyes. So there's this ring around a black hole and then apparently there was another, um, ex I don't want to call it an experiment because it was an observation, but, um, they apparently witnessed two black holes converging into one black hole. And if a steady state theory would be um, 
validated, you would expect to see the loss of energy represented in a um, static size of the resulting black hole, meaning it wouldn't grow proportion proportionally to the mass or the expected mass of the two black holes that are bumping into each other. They would kind of bump into each other and stay the same size. Because time's going the other way, I guess. But they didn't witness that. They witnessed it grow. And because it grew, that was evidence that the energy being basically kicked back out into the universe was more chaotic than the energy being lost to the system, even though the energy being lost to the system is all-consuming, even light itself. So this is, in my opinion, probably if society exists in 10, 20, 30 years, going to be looked back at as a flawed or incomplete observation, if it even happened as, as it was described to me. So what I would hypothesize is that if that same black hole were, were to be monitored over a protracted period of time, that the black hole would do one of two things. It would shrink or it would grow. And that sounds like you can't lose, but ultimately it's not about the um, the size of the black hole. It's about is it consuming more than it's emitting? And I would say that any observation at a distance over a short period of time, which is any human lifetime when we're talking about this stuff, um, is laughable as a scientific proof because there's no way to measure how much energy is going into that system or how much energy is being truly emitted. In other words, there could be a whole planet's worth of stardust being sucked into a black hole every second and from a telescope you're not going to be able to observe that and I appreciate that two black holes bumping into each other is a uniquely extreme situation but it's hardly a controlled experiment um, and it's certainly not being observed over an appropriate period of time. So you could imagine, or I could imagine, that a black hole is in fact a multi-layered um, astrological, astronomical, whatever, uh, anomaly. It's not doing one particular thing throughout its entire existence. What we can observe is probably um, very different than what's happening a uh, hundred miles into it or a thousand miles into it. And if you were to travel to its core, um, it's unimaginable what a dramatic difference there might be between the core, what's happening in a, in a physics sense at the center of a black hole compared to what's happening in the atmosphere of a black hole. And um, to say that what's going to happen at the atmosphere on a, on a physics level is going to immediately impact what's happening at the core on a physics level, I think is... Also, I mean, it's such an extreme environment, but you also have to imagine it's relative to our world right now, 
the atmosphere of a black hole is as extreme as you can get, but it might be equally as an extreme difference between the atmosphere of a black hole and the surface of a black hole. Um, and I think that that is where, if time does reverse in the sense that structure is, in, is being reimposed, upon chaos then um it wouldn't be immediate in its uh in its collapsing of itself you know what i mean so i don't think that anything has necessarily been proven as far as i do think hawking's radiation has been proven but I don't think that proves a net energy output that exceeds the energy input. You know what I mean? And I mean that in an opposite sense uh, than energy. I mean that in an enthalpy sense. The enthalpy being generated by Hawking's radiation is significantly less than the enthalpy that is disappearing from our universe by the very existence of a black hole in the first place. A fraction, you know, a tiny fraction. And if that's the case, then that is a vehicle for a perpetual state universe. And it's just something that we can't understand. Inside a sun, time is going this way and we get light and inside a black hole time is going this way time time is going backwards over here time is going forwards over here and time itself is the generator so to speak i mean i could go a little bit deeper but with the um time actually being a byproduct of, of friction between energy and space and energy and space interacting with each other creates time but it's not generating time it's kind of um it it, it the more you think about it, the more you don't understand it. But when I think about it quickly, it does make sense to me, if that makes sense. Time and space are like this. Energy and matter are like this. And when time and space and energy matter rub against each other, we get gravity. That's what I was trying to say, not time. Time, space, energy, matter rub together, you get gravity. Gravity is a uh, energy loss symptom of that. But um, the reason it won't spin out of control infinitely is because on the other end of the spectrum, there's a black hole sucking that juice up and... Ultimately, this is where it's just maybe logical or a logical fallacy. Ultimately, that time-space paradigm would flip like a magnet and a black hole would explode and, you know, other matter would get that was once outside a black hole would get pulled into a different black hole and time and space reverse direction essentially i mean it's happening over time so to speak um because a black hole doesn't instantly absorb all matter in the universe at the same rate a black hole might explode once it reaches some sort of critical mass but that would be the the, the mechanism um and so to believe in a perpetual motion machine, in my opinion, is not crazy. It is a legitimate scientific theory that would 
facilitate a unending universe. And it is no more crazy than to believe in an origination without a outside force. Right? So if you are ultimately saying, all right, well, I believe in God, so that's my outside force, okay? Then you believe in a multiverse. That's fine. I have no problem with it. I just want the semantics clear because within a universe, one, there is no outside force that could provide a spark, right? And in a multiverse, a, another entity provided that spark and is not of this universe. And that is the only alternative without violating physics as we know it for the Big Bang to be the beginning. A multi-dimensional reality in which God exists in another universe or another verse. I like that. It's another verse. It's not another universe. It's another verse. And, um, does that then, as a consequence, open up the possibility to many, many verses? I would say it has to. So it's kind of like, um, you don't know what you don't know. And once you theorize beyond the event horizon, it's all religion. But what we can see inside the event horizon is, in my opinion, lack of angular momentum and incomplete analysis of black hole physics. That's, that's within the scope of scientific thought. We have to be able to observe it. So everything within the event horizon, what I see from a layman's perspective is no evidence of angular momentum from the Big Bang. Obviously we see angular momentum and gravitational forces driving the entire universe, but we don't see clear evidence of angular momentum as a consequence of the Big Bang. We don't see it. And we have very, very sketchy black hole observational science. That's what I see. So I don't think it's settled science. I've talked about this many times before. I think that our entire educational system is slanted and biased and um, racist against uh, cultural and uh, ideological diversity and um, that the uh, multiverse theory and the steady state theory and the Big Bang theory uh, at this point all hold equal weight and water and it is really um, fair game for any theologist or scientist to uh, question any of them at any point. I don't think it's even close to civil science and I've, I've looked hard and I've seen pleas to authority and I've seen uh, insults and such, but I haven't seen really compelling arguments to the contrary to say, no, it's settled. Like, I haven't seen it. So, um, that's my opinion on it. I, I happen to believe in the steady state universe. I happen to think that the universe had no beginning. It will have no end. We have 
uh, the ability to persist indefinitely. Really, that's what I believe. Um, no, no, it's going to end anyway. It's not. It's it's not going to end anyway. It's really... How many times are we going to hit rewind? You know, that's, that's what it comes down to in the math. How many... How many infinities are infinities enough before you get infinity out? <laughs> right? So, that's it.